This talk today was sort of brought to you by Alec Weissacher, even though it's really brought to you by Coach Shaker. Uh, a while back, Alec wrote me and said, can we find someone to talk about what the heck's up with Java 8 and what are the changes involved from, say, Java 7 and before? So thankfully, uh, Khalid said, hey, I'll do that. Just give me enough time to actually put together my talk. And so here he is, and enjoy. Sure. Um, so today I decided to give a talk um, mainly as a sort of breadth first survey of what's in Java 8. Um, possibly in the future we can go deeper into some of the new features. Um, and if people have individual questions as I'm going through and I'm talking quickly, feel free to stop me and ask questions as well. Um, in terms of uh, the list of new features, how uh, they're divided up for this talk, uh, go over the, the heart of the Java 8 changes, which are uh, uh, Project Lambda, um, the, then the new utilities that have been added around uh, this Lambda functionality um, and other sort of goodies that have been added as well for people to use. Um, broken out uh, little highlights on a new JavaScript engine that was added to Java 8, uh, Zonga's, as well as uh, graphical user interface API updates. Um, via JavaFX, um, and for, uh, in addition to the code, some of the meta information, including Javadoc and annotations, some of the changes around there. And then um, just a, a quick uh, breeze through some of the optimizations that have been added uh, to either um, allow um, Java usage on smaller Internet of Things sort of devices or for performance optimizations, and then uh, lastly, a section on uh, security updates. So, um, again, the heart of the Java uh, 8 update was this Project Lambda. And it first starts off with the sort of concept of uh, allowing uh, Java developers to write less code by making a smaller compiler. And it um, starts with a simple thing such as um, allowing, based on method context, to figure out uh, the types of uh, generic methods. Um, so in this case, uh, we in Java 7, you had to tell um, the uh, code that this was uh, a, a, an integer being used in the list. Um, instead, as of Java 8, the compiler can figure that out. Um, that also applies to when you're chaining together methods as well. All that can be inferred by the Java compiler. Um, now, Project Lambda has a number of enhancement proposals that were implemented uh, across the language, but um, I'll sort of just uh, leave that for further reading if, if people really want to know uh, the devil in the, you know, behind the scenes uh, features. Um, but in terms of uh, just giving an overview, one of the first changes was that if you have an interface, just like in classes, you could always have static methods before. Now you can have static methods within your interfaces that can be invoked. Um, I'm sure uh, finding Java developer, you've used static methods before. Now you can declare them in your interface. Um, in a similar way, there's now this concept of default methods that one can put into an interface. And in this case, uh, you have this interface with an abstract method called getName, but you want to provide a default way of saying hello. And um, when one extends and implements that interface, in this case with an anonymous class that implements the get name, you can still call on instances of this interface the default method and call, like, example, say, hello. Yes? Is there multiple default methods that that are the There's ways of uh, sort of, spec you have to override and basically say which one you're you're calling into. If you, you know. Um, Basically, the way you would call into super. Um, uh, so you can you can have um, for any of these default methods, you can override them in uh, implementations of the class, like in later classes. And there's ways of calling into the, the there's language uh, ways of calling into specific super methods as well. Um, so uh, now with these default methods, there's also now, this sort of gets into the lambda, we're starting to get more into lambdas and the, the uh, functional programming um, that's been added to Java 8. So now the compiler is able to uh, 
basically figure out if you have an interface that has a single abstract method that takes some set of parameters and returns some type, instead of having to implement uh, the, the interface um, method, and in this case saying implement, you know, override this get name method and return the string, you can use this new lambda syntax, which is just open and close braces, which says I don't take any parameters, and then it goes to or it returns um, this string, my example, and it's a much more compact way of representing um, that. And again, it's, it's um, this at functional interface is a way of explicitly saying, you know, you can have compiler checks saying that this only has this one abstract method. Um, you don't have to put that. It's kind of like at override, you, you want to put it there just for the extra compile time checking. Um, and your interfaces can still have multiple default methods as well. Um, and you'll, you'll see that in a lot of the functional interfaces that are provided by free for uh, from the new Java 8 libraries. Um, those functions, uh, those functional interfaces that are implemented in Java, um, so we talked about like uh, they have this one default abstract method that takes in some set of parameters and it has a return type. There are a suite of different functional interfaces that declare these different abstract methods. Um, and they do, they're anything from a simple function that takes in some type T and returns a type R, so it takes in two values, a T and a U, and returns an R, um, or takes in an, uh, some T and returns an integer, or the reverse takes in an integer and then returns some type R. And uh, one of the ones we'll get into in the future is this uh, predicate, um, which is used to say, I take in some T and I'm going to return a Boolean true or false. Um, and then, uh, as I talked about, like there's default methods uh, that are allowed in functional interfaces. So there's still, for example, in the predicate, there's default methods that are um, available for uh, doing um, uh, chaining together ors, ands, and, and doing negation uh, on the predicate as well. Um, so one of the first examples that uses the um, uh, these uh, functional interfaces is this concept of an optional type, um, uh, this optional uh, container. Um, and you can think of it, uh, I think Jeff and others have described it as, uh, you have this box, and you always have a box. And instead of, you know, you have null, you always have a box. But the box can either contain an item, or the box can be empty. It's one of those two things. Um, now, this, this, this typed box can contain some type T, or contain, for optimization, integer, or long, double. Um, you can always say, get me the item for the box, but that could you know, get you into trouble because the box would be empty, so you can say get or else, um, or, el or else throw. You can check if, the, um, if a certain, uh, um, using functional interfaces, if an item is present. Um, you can even uh, ask, based on this sort of predicate func uh, functional interface, if um, a certain uh, value is there or you're passed into your function, the, the the, what could be in the box, and you return uh, true or false. Um, and uh, there's, um, in that case, the filter is returning uh, a, um, if upon success, it returns uh, either your box with the, the element, or it returns an empty box back to you. You can also map from one type to another. Um, say you have a box that contains integers, you can convert that to a box that contains strings using a mapper function. Um, and then um, slightly more advanced, there's this concept of flat mapping as well, where instead of returning um, the, the actual item, you return the box yourself. And that gets into sort of um, higher level uh, functionality. Um, I won't go into here, but again, maybe a future talk. Um, there's uh, also, for constructing the boxes, there's the optional of, um, don't use it. Um, it's the, the problem with that is uh, if you pass in a null value, it will you'll end up with a null pointer exceptions again. There's a of nullable, which will do the check for you. You need to return your, your box with a value or without the value. Um, all right, so that's, uh, sure. So is, do you find this to be fluent enough that you use it all the time, or is it a... Uh, I will say I see it all the time. I'm not... Um, uh, the question was, uh, uh, 
do I find optional fluid enough that I use it all the time? I, I, I see it in a, a lot of code. You'll, and, um, um, it is, I would say, a recommended one should get away from using uh, checking for null in general. And hopefully it will reduce the number of null pointer exceptions flying around in code in the future. Um, a place uh, kind of what you're saying, like where I see it, um, is actually, it turns out, was streaming. Um, so streams are another type of collection where you're just talking about optionals as one box of stream. Instead of containing a single item, contains, think of it like as a collection of items, um, possibly. And, uh, um, and uh, as you go along this stream, uh, you can filter to convert it from one collection uh, to filter it down to uh, some subset collection. Um, you can also uh, map the individual items in the collection from one type to another, and then you can uh, reduce that co collection down to, um, uh, say, a single value. In this case, we're calling the average um, function. Now, um, there's actually two different uh, syntaxes here. Um, so um, in the mapping, we're explicitly implementing the functional interface. Well, it turns out with a sort of uh, the lambda syntax, you can um, just say that I'm going to take in a car and I want to um, invoke the method uh, get price instead. Um, so, you know, we can simplify th that syntax down uh, to this form. But the compiler is also smart enough to figure out that, like, the, the car variable that's being passed into the map, uh, the map is of type car, so you can actually leave that out. Um, so you have this, you just say, you know, car goes to and then call the car get price. And then there's one other sort of concept that's added on top of this. If you're just going to be calling a method on um, uh, the variable that's being passed in, you can actually pass in just the name of that method into um, the, the, uh, the invocation of the map or the filter, et cetera. Um, and the way you do that is with what's called a method reference. Um, and in this case, we're saying, like, when you're doing your mapping, just call, like, on, on the car, call the getPrice method. Um, and there's ways of uh, specifying uh, these different method references. The separator is always uh, double colon. If you're uh, invoking it on some, like, again, I have a, a car class and I'm going to call the car uh, get price. Um, you can just use it on uh, regular uh, class method names. You can invoke it on individual variables. A uh, case where you'll see that a lot is if you have a comparator instance and you want to call um, the method for compare on that instance of the comparator, you can still use the, the method reference there on the instance of the variable. Um, there's uh, ways of calling static methods, um, et cetera, and uh, even calling constructors as well by using the special uh, new method name. Um, so that's very quick overview on lambdas. Um, uh, from there, we'll go into some of the new utilities that are um, uh, available within uh, Java 8. Um, first one, uh, for anybody who's uh, tried to use unsigned integers within Java before. This was a little bit difficult. There's new library methods uh, for parsing and uh, converting uh, um, integer and long uh, representations into unsigned integers. There's also uh, math um, functions for doing unsigned division. Um, all these can be, again, passed in as method references into streams as you're filtering, mapping, reducing. Um, and there's a hash code method that's a static implementation as well that can be used uh, if, if needed. Um, if you're building these streams and performing arithmetic, a lot of times you don't want to accidentally overflow. Uh, so there are utility methods now that are with exact in the name uh, in Java Lang Math. And if you use these methods, anytime they detect an overflow, they will throw an exception for you. And so that can just make streaming easier. Uh, for those who are interested in doing division, or uh, especially on negative numbers, if you want those numbers to always move towards negative infinity, there's a floor division method and uh, floor modulus operator. Um, the biggest utility there is that um, 
it uses the, the, the sign matches the divisor instead of uh, the dividend. So um, get more into utilities and collections. Uh, there's ability now um, to uh, use these sort of uh, functional um, interfaces to set values across an entire collection of values. Um, in this case, um, the set all um, uh, is passed in an integer and uh, needs something that returns a double. Um, and it will set each index of that double array as it runs along the stream. Um, there's a parallel version as well. There's a lot of concurrency updates in Java 8 as well that I'll get into. And then um, there's uh, ways of doing your own streaming as well if you want to do customized streaming um, by retrieving the stream or, again, by doing multi-threaded parallel streaming. Um, for sorting, there's also the ability to do the sorting using thread pooling. Um, behind the scenes and uh, ways of doing what they call uh, accumulation um, as you uh, pass along either subsections or the entire array, um, possibly doing a uh, addition or some other operation, um, and it's overloaded for all the different types um, as you uh, as you pass through the stream. Yep. Huh? You said thread pulling behind the scenes. Yes. How does it? How is that configured? Um, I believe it uses a default uh, fork join pool that may be configurable with system properties. Um, I That's my understanding. Um, I don't know 100% for sure, though. Um, but it, it's one of these things where, in other languages as well, it's just like, um, it's magic that's provided for you, and sometimes you can do it. So that actually I thought was interesting because, you know, Java 8, Java 9, they seem to be, it has been pointed out that they have been taking bits and pieces from their one of their JVM brethren, Scala, right? But, like, Scala's moving away from the parallel collection stuff that they introduced a while back for kind of this reason, and that's... It's possible that Java 9 will catch up, but no. <laughs> <laughs> but these are available uh, if you want you know, to take advantage in your implementation by default if you know that you, know, you can do this parallel sorting. The, the library is there for you. Um, uh, another feature, this one I actually use a lot, uh, is... Um, Prior to uh, Java 8, um, if you were just using the core library, one had to use Java util date, and it's a sort of brethren. Um, and if you were frustrated with that, uh, there was an external library called Jota Time. Well, the developers um, associated with that project and using that project um, submitted requests and uh, had a, most of that functionality incorporated into a new java.time package. Um, it includes uh, a ton of new functionality for um, parsing uh, various standard strings um, and um, tracking dates with offsets and uh, time zones, et cetera. Um, if, you, if, there were, if there happens to be something in Jota time that did not make it for you, there's this 310 extra things that made it, did not make it into the JSR 310 uh, implementation uh, that should cover the rest of the features that um, didn't make it into Jota time. So um, I personally, this is one of my favorite features that's been added. Um, another little feature that's been added, if you happen to use uh, named groups within your regular expressions, you can now retrieve the start and end using the name of that uh, group instead of using the indexing. Um, for those who uh, do internationalization and localization, uh, there's a lot of uh, new um, characters available, uh, new scripts available as of Java 8. Um, functionality for um, importing uh, locales can be specified just by the Java runtime environment, or if you want to use locale information imported from the Unicode consortium, their common locale data repository formats is now supported by uh, Java 8. Um, and for users who actually uh, want to use multiple fallback locales on their computers. Java 8 supports this concept of um, looking up a locale and, and um, 
using uh, um, a, this BCP uh, 47 uh, fallback formatting um, of specifying multiple locales. Um, there uh, used to be uh, no way of doing base64 encoding and decoding that is now in the libraries. Um, previously, uh, people had to use Apache Commons or similar for, or implement your role your own or something like that. Um, that's now built in. Um, for those who like to uh, invoke other processes, um, you can now actually see if they're still alive um, using the standard library. Um, and if uh, you don't want them to be, you can not only politely ask them to die, you can forcibly kill them. Um, uh, and then I said that um, I'm not going to go too deep into this. There's a, a lot of changes to the Java concurrency model. Um, as Jeff mentioned, there have been other changes to other JVM languages to update uh, concurrency as well. Uh, um, but uh, for example, one of the, the new features as of Java 8 is um, a concept of a future that is not just this interface that might return a value, but uh, it's, a, it's called a completable future where you can actually set the value. Um, for those of you with a Scala background, this is a promise. Um, and uh, there's this completion stage interface, which allows you to also chain together features and say, and then, and then, and then, or um, do exception handling based on the future context. Um, so uh, for database users who may be updating millions and millions of rows, there is the concept of um, uh, executing large updates and having that value not get truncated when it comes back to you. Um, there are, uh, for folks that were interested in uh, using um, JDBC with uh, um, setting the different uh, types uh, for uh, retrieving data, and previously those were integers, now there are enums, um, the SQL types of JDBC type enums. Um, there, uh, oh, sure, yeah. So would you, Why would you ever not use execute large update or, uh, you know, as opposed to the non-large one? The quick answer is because your driver doesn't support JDBC 4.2. Okay. Um, so. So but, as soon as it does, then there's no reason not to. Uh, yeah. It's, it's there if you would like to use it. And so. Um, okay. Um, all right, so um, this isn't in the, the uh, core library itself, but there are also two uh, updates that were added to the larger Java standard environment, uh, standard edition. Um, uh, there's a new JavaScript engine uh, that replaces the old uh, Mozilla implementation that was con uh, contributed to Java. This new one is called Nashorn. Um, one of the features that they've added is if you want to call Java code from JavaScript using this JJS application, you can do so now. Um, I personally don't have use cases for this, but I'm positive there's some people out there who want to do this. It's called Java from JavaScript. Um, there's also, and there was before, the ability to call JavaScript from Java if you wanted to have scripting within your application um, and, and have that interact with Java. Um, an example of that is uh, you um, can have some functional uh, string that then gets evaluated, um, and then uh, it, uh, the engine has this function that you can later invoke with your scripting. Um, so uh, for those of you who do uh, graphical <laughs> user interfaces, um, JavaFX has been out for a while. Uh, AWT was replaced by Swing, uh, replaced where um, they're both still around. Um, but, and now JavaFX is the next evolution. Um, as of um, a previous update to Java 7, it was available um, by default, um, but now Java 8 is the first full release that includes JavaFX, and JavaFX has been bumped to uh, 
version number uh, eight. And uh, within uh, JavaFX eight, there are new APIs for doing things like printing and multiple uh, line text boxes um, and um, high DPI support uh, for your larger monitors as well. Um, now, uh, in addition to the code uh, itself, there's also a lot of times other information that one may store within your Java files. Um, uh, one of the, um, the simplest ones is the parameter names. Uh, those uh, can now be retrieved using reflection if you compile with Java C dash parameters. Um, by default, uh, this is disabled, uh, but now there's this option. Um, for those who are documenting their code using Java doc, um, and uh, when uh, previously, when you ran the Java doc uh, tool, it wouldn't do much validation on the HTML that it generated. Now, by default, there is a linter that's run across all of your, your written Java doc, and it'll uh, actually exit if it finds errors uh, due to um, bad method references or uh, even accessibility issues um, um, in your in your inline uh, Java doc. Um, these can be enabled or disabled by individual group, but um, a lot of places I've actually seen are, are just sort of turning it off um, in whole by using doclet none. So um, that's uh, an option instead of fixing it if you want. Um, <laughs> Um, for those who actually uh, need to parse uh, uh, the Java doc or build tools that are running the Java doc, um, there's ways of um, now instead of just um, uh, shell execing the Java doc tool, you can actually invoke that now from Java itself. And there are um, enhanced uh, APIs uh, if one wants to really get down into abstract, abstract syntax trees of the Java doc. There's an extension of the compiler tree API for walking through that Java doc as well. Um, so um, in addition to Java doc, uh, there's also the ability uh, to do Java annotations within your code. Um, as of Java 8, there's now this new target called uh, element type type use, which says that your annotation can be used anywhere um, you have a type. Um, there is a similar one that usually gets a, uh, um, added along with the element type type use. That's type parameter that says that uh, this annotation specifically can appear before um, a generic type of um, attribute as well. Um, Similarly, an enhancement that has been added is that annotations can now be repeated. The way you do that is you declare the container class that contains all those different annotations. Um, and then you can retrieve that uh, container at uh, runtime as well. And for those who are actually retrieving the annotations um, and, and using this functionality, the annotation processing uh, tool was deprecated in Java 7. It's gone as of Java 8. All this functionality has been added to Java C. Um, the Java compiler, and um, there are uh, new APIs available uh, for doing um, uh, annotation processing using um, behind the scenes uh, core re reflection um, as well. Um, all right, so in terms of other behind the scenes work, um, a lot of work has been done to help um, shrink uh, the Java runtime and help it fit onto you know smaller and smaller devices and also pro provide performance optimizations. Uh, the first one is this concept of profiles, compact profiles um, of the Java standard environment, and it goes all the way from the the core code in Compact One to larger and larger encapsulations that go um, that maybe out in uh, um, in Compact Two you start to have uh, the database API APIs. Um, all the way up to the full standard edition. And you can target your applications to just support um, these smaller and smaller um, distributions. Um, internally, for those uh, who use HashMap, it has been updated um, uh, to provide better performance with the trade-off of if you have legacy applications that uh, required um, a specific iteration order. This will most likely break your tests if you're switching over from like Java 7 to Java 8. Um, but otherwise, it shouldn't affect you. 
Um, I was going to say, if you have tests. If you have tests, yes. Yeah, that's what I um, uh, Internally, what's going on is if you have a hash map where you have a lot of keys that are colliding and all the data is ending up in the same bin, instead now they're using balanced trees uh, to represent that data as well. Or instead, and now uh, the iteration order when you retrieve from that balance tree, of course, is different than it was in the previous implementations. They did that this to the concurrent hash map. Concurrent hash map is um, kind of like when we talked about these behind the the, the scenes, um, uh, or sorry, not behind the scenes, uh, the ability to do uh, parallel sorting. Um, concurrent hash map is often used in a lot of multi-threaded applications. Um, they did not add it to the super legacy uh, Java util hash table, which has been around since the beginning of Java, just because they have test code that would break if um, they were to change that iteration implementation. Um, a list of other behind the scenes optimizations uh, that are made as well. One uh, example is, um, as I said, uh, they really focused um, in this latest uh, version um, of being able to shrink the JVM, and they targeted uh, the ability to, to shrink the JVM all the way down to a three megabyte binary that uh, can hopefully fit on smaller devices. Um, if one goes to uh, Docker Hub right now, I think the smallest image is 45 megabytes. But, um, so, um, so this will hopefully help with uh, slimming down that. Um, and for those who are building these sort of custom JVMs, um, there is also the ability to uh, actually tie together JNI code um, statically. Previously, if you wanted to uh, distribute your library with a JVM, you had to do it with a dynamic library. Now you can call system load library on a statically linked um, uh, library as well. So, um, lastly, uh, there are uh, security updates to um, the Java library just to sort of enhance uh, the functionality that was already there. Um, there are uh, new implementations of hashing algorithms, um, encryption standards that are available by default in the, the Java library. And for those who need cryptographically secure uh, random number generation, um, and there's, I've seen some debate online whether or not to use dev u random or dev random. Um, before with Java, you had to specify the, the source of your uh, random using some system property. By default now, there's uh, different methods that, um, that are like, uh, just if you invoke, um, just new secure random, it'll use the non-blocking u random. If you call, uh, the Guinness and Strong, it'll uh, use the, um, the, the blocking dev random, which should add a little bit more entropy to your uh, random number generation, um, I believe. Um, uh, there are also uh, security updates that have been um, added to the, the suite of libraries. Uh, one of the ones that's actually interesting to me is if you are trying to store uh, key information on the actual file system and, uh, and, and use that from Java. Um, previously, you always had to use the Java key store file format. And now, as of uh, Java 8, there's this PKCS 12 standard library, or, or standard uh, file format that one can use um, to store uh, key information. Um, for those of you who use MySQL, um, you've definitely used key stores before. Um, and um, in addition to the you know regular security updates, there are security updates that are more to focused towards uh, interacting with HTTPS. Um, well, one example is uh, when you're doing certificate revocation checks. It used to be like you could either fail all or just turn them off completely. Now you can build your own custom handling as well in terms of APIs. Um, so that's what I have for. Today, um, I'm happy to go deeper into um, some of these things if people have questions. And uh, otherwise, thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.